Today, we're going to talk about one of the most important events in the history of deep learning. We're going to talk about what happened at ImageNet 2012 and how that launched the sort of deep learning rocket ship that we've been strapped to for the past decade. So in short, we're going to talk about ImageNet and, and where it came from, why it was so important. And then we're going to have a look at, very briefly going to have a look at convolutional neural networks and AlexNet, which is the model that triggered the sort of massive growth of deep learning. And for me, I like to back everything up with code. So uh, what we'll do is towards the end of the video, we're going to go through the PyTorch implementation of AlexNet and we're actually going to test it on a small image net like data set. And that'll be quite useful because we can see sort of image pre-processing steps and also how to perform inference with a convolutional neural network like AlexNet. So let's jump straight into it. Today's deep learning revolution traces its roots back to the 30th of September, 2012. On this day, a deep layered convolutional neural network won the ImageNet 2012 uh, challenge. And this convolutional neural network didn't just win, it completely destroyed the rest of the competition. Now this model, you might have guessed, is called AlexNet. And the simple fact that even used convolutional neural networks was very new. Convolutional neural networks had been around for a while, but using them had kind of been deemed impractical. Yet, when AlexNet's results came in, uh, it proved sort of unparalleled performance on what was seen as the one of the hardest um, challenges of the time for computer vision. So this event, made AlexNet the first widely acknowledged successful implementation of deep learning. And the sheer performance improvement that it showed caught people's attention. Until this point, deep learning was unproven. Uh, it, it was simply a nice idea that most people just decided, okay, it's impractical. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough compute to do anything like this. But AlexNet showed that this was not the case and that deep learning was now practical. Yet this sort of surge of interest in deep learning was not solely you know, thanks to AlexNet. ImageNet also played a big part in this. The foundation of applied deep learning uh, was set by ImageNet and built upon by, by AlexNet. So let's begin with ImageNet. Back in 2006, the world of computer vision was a lot different to how we know it now. Uh, it was pretty underfunded. It didn't really get that much attention. Yet, there were a lot of researchers around the world focused on building better models. And year after year, they saw progress, but it was slow. In that same year, a woman called Fei Fei Li had just finished her computer vision PhD at Caltech and had started working as a professor in computer science and had noticed this sort of focus in the field of computer vision on the models and the subsequent lack of focus on data. And an idea came to Lee that maybe a data set that was more representative of the world could improve the performance of the model as being trained on it. Around the same time as this, there was another professor called Christiana Felbaum, and she was a co-developer of a data set from the 1980s called WordNet. Now, WordNet consisted of a pretty large number of English language terms organized into a ontological structure. So, for example, for the term Siberian Husky, uh, that would be within a tree structure and above Siberian Husky, you would have working dog. Above working dog, you would have dog. Above dog, you'd have canine, carnivore, and, and so on. So there's like that tree structure of different terms and where they and how they relate to each other. In 2007, Lee and Felbaum met and Felbaum discussed her work on, or her idea at the time of adding just a reference image to each of the terms within WordNet. So the intention was not to create a image data set, but it was simply to add like a reference image so people could more easily understand what that particular term was about. 
And this inspired an idea from Lee that would kickstart the world of computer vision and deep learning. So soon after, Lee put together a team to build what would become the largest labeled data set of images in the world called ImageNet. The idea behind ImageNet was that a large ontological based data set like WordNet, but for images, could be the key behind building more advanced content-based image retrieval, object recognition, scene recognition, and better visual understanding in computer vision models. And just two years later, the first version of ImageNet was released with 12 million labeled images. These were all structured and labeled in line with the WordNet ontology, yet if we consider the, the sheer size of that, the, the 12 million images, if one person had spent literally every single day labeling one image per minute and did literally nothing else in, in that time, they didn't eat, they didn't sleep, just, just labeled images, it would have taken them 22 years and 10 months, which obviously is a very long time. There's just an insane number of images to be labeled here. So how how did they do it? Because the team was not huge. They didn't have like an infinite amount of money to pay other researchers and students to do this. So what they eventually settled on was a platform called Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is a crowdsourcing platform where people from around the globe will perform tasks such as labeling images for a set amount of money and because there's just the in insane scale of people around the world uh, doing this at competitive prices that made ImageNet possible with a few adjustments to the labeling process because uh, in reality if you just have random people around the world labeling your your data set uh, some of those people are going to try and take advantage of that maybe game the system so you have to have some checks and balances in place um, against that. So, you know, there's a little bit of system design in there, um, but that is how they built the data set. Now, on its release, uh, ImageNet was the largest publicly available labeled data set of images in the world, yet there was very little interest in the data set, uh, which seems pretty crazy when we look back on that in hindsight because now we know okay we we want more data for our models to to make them better but at the time things things were different so image that came with these 12 million images uh, distributed across 22,000 categories and at the time there there were the odd other image data sets that use a similar sort of structure and idea. So for example, the ESP data set use like something called the ESP game and people would play the ESP game and label images for the, for the data set. Now, reportedly they had way more images, um, but it wasn't publicly released. They only publicly released 60,000 of those, uh, of those images. Um, and a couple of years later, there were a few papers that kind of looked at the ESP game and ESP data set and said, okay, it's probably not actually that useful because you can kind of guess the right answer most of the time without even looking at the image. So there were some questions around the usability of that data set. So all this to say, um, ImageNet was by far the, the, the biggest at least publicly available uh, and, and most sort of accurate uh, data set for, for computer vision at the time. So the reason that there was very little interest in ImageNet, despite its uh, huge size, is that people just assumed that it could not work for their models. Like you have to think back then, they were training models on much smaller data sets, which had like 12 categories of, of images, for example, and the models would struggle with that. So when ImageNet comes along and it's like, hey, I have 22,000 categories here, uh, people are just gonna be like, well, I can't deal with 12, so I'm, I'm not gonna even try 22,000, that's crazy. So 
there was a lack of interest in ImageNet at the time. Um, it, it just wasn't really received that warmly. So the ImageNet team decided to to you know try and push it a bit more. So by the next year, 2010, they had managed to organize a, a challenge with the data set, a classification challenge initially, and they, they grew into different things um, over the years, but initially it's just a classification challenge. So the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge was first hosted in 2010 and competitors had to correctly classify images from 1000 categories so not not a full set of terms in the in the ontology of imagenet uh, but they had 1000 uh, categories instead and whoever produced the model with the lowest error rate won Okay, and, and there were a few entrants. So there was not a huge number of entrants. I think it's something like four, five, six entrants in the first, um, in 2010, 2011, 2012. Now, eventually, this challenge would become the primary benchmark in uh, computer vision progress. Uh, but it, it took some time. And that really started in 2012. So 2012 was not like the previous years for ImageNet. On the 30th of September 2012, the latest challenge results uh, were released and uh, one of those results was a lot better than any of the other results and it came from a, a model that most people thought was just not practical and that was AlexNet. AlexNet was the first model to score a sub 25% error rate and that same year the nearest competitor was a was 9.8 percentage points behind AlexNet. And they had done this with a deep layered convolutional neural network, which at the time people were not really taking seriously. Now to understand AlexNet, it's probably best we very quickly cover a little bit of what a convolutional neural network actually is. So a convolutional neural network or, or CNN is a neural network layer that has a, a, a special layer called a convolutional layer. And today, the, these models are known for computer vision. They have been for quite a long time, sort of undisputed champions of computer vision. And actually, you know, that has changed a little bit in literally like the past couple of years. Um, but right now, they're, they're still pretty dominant. And unlike a lot of the models back in 2012 and, and earlier, these did not need uh, too much sort of manual feature extraction or, or, or too much image pre-processing uh, before feeding data into the model. They could just kind of deal with that themselves. CNNs use several of these convolutional layers stacked on top of each other. And uh, what you find is that the deeper the network is, um, the more, the better it can identify more sort of complex uh, concepts or, or objects in, in images. So for example, the first with the first few layers, you're, you're probably going to just kind of identify, okay, this is an edge, this is a circle maybe, this is this shape, and maybe some textures. As the network gets deeper and you add more layers to it, it starts to abstract those features and identify more abstract ideas. So a deeper network will be able to identify, okay, this is like a, a living thing. And then you go, you, you build a deeper network and it can identify uh, mammals and then it can identify dogs and then it can identify Siberian Huskies. So as the, as the model gets deeper, um, its performance and its ability to identify uh, more nuanced things gets better. So at the time, uh, the, these models were overlooked because uh, essentially to train these to, to get good performance from one of these models, you, they need to be really deep, which means that they have a lot of parameters, okay? And it's uh, the more parameters you have, the longer it's gonna take your model to train, if you can train it at all, if it's, if it's too big and doesn't even fit in the memory on your computer. And also the more parameters it has, uh, the more data it has to see before it can produce sort of any, any good performance of, of anything. As a result of this, they were simply overlooked. Yet, the authors of, of AlexNet 
won the ImageNet Challenge in 2012. And it turns out that they were the, the right people in the right place at the right time. Several pieces came from, from different places um, to create this. ImageNet provided a massive amount of data needed to train one of these deep layered convolutional neural networks. A few years earlier in 2007, NVIDIA had released CUDA, uh, which you, you may recognize the name of. So an API that allowed software access to the lower level, highly parallel processing abilities of CUDA enabled GPUs from NVIDIA. And GPU power in itself was reaching a point where this, you know, training these big models was becoming possible, although uh, it, it wasn't quite there yet at the time for a single GPU. So AlexNet was by no means small. And because of that, the authors had to solve a, a lot of problems to get all of this working. So AlexNet consisted of five convolutional layers followed by three fully connected linear layers. The final layer to, to produce the you know, 1000 uh, classifications required by ImageNet was a 1000 node uh, layer that used a softmax activation function to create this sort of probability uh, distribution over all of those uh, classes. Now, a key conclusion from AlexNet was that the depth of the network was key to, to getting the performance that they got. And that depth, as I mentioned before, it creates a lot of parameters that need to be trained. Making training the model either impractically slow or just simply impossible. Or at least that was the case if you were going to train it on CPU. So they had to turn to GPUs, but at the time, the high-end GPUs only had a memory of about three gigabytes, which was not enough for AlexNet. So to make it work, they had to distribute AlexNet across two GPUs. And they did this by pretty much splitting the layers uh, in two and having you know, half of the network on one GPU, half the network on the other GPU, and having a couple of connections between the, the layers. So they had a couple of points where the information could be passed between those two halves. And then at the end, they, they came together into the final classification layer. Another important factor is that they uh, swapped the more typical softmax and tanh activation functions of the time for a rectified linear unit or ReLU activation function, uh, which again, further improved the efficiency of the model and also meant that they didn't require uh, normalization that you would usually have to do if you had tanh or softmax uh, because both of those activation functions over many layers you can get what's called a saturation in your activations which means the the activations in your in your neurons either kind of push towards the, the two limits of one of those activation functions so for example with softmax you'd end up or your activations be pushed towards the one or, or zero Nonetheless, they did use another type of normalization called local response normalization, but that's not really used um, anymore. Nonetheless, for AlexNet, um, that was still a, a critical component. Now, another super important thing that is still used today uh, that AlexNet introduced was the use of overlapping in the pooling layers. Now, pooling was already used in convolutional networks and it essentially just summarizes um, a, a window of information from one layer into a, a single activation value in the next layer. Now, overlapping pooling does the same thing, but there's, a, there's an overlap in the window that, get, that gets passed along in the preceding layer. So there's always, it always sees a little bit of the previous window, okay? And they found that this reduces overfitting of the model and improves the performance. So that is, <laughs> how they got AlexNet to work and a few of the details behind actually, you know, how it, it worked and why it worked so well at the time. Now, I think it's great to talk about all of this, um, but as I said at the start, I think it's better to go through everything or back everything up with a little bit of code. So we'll go through a, a notebook that you can find a link to the Colab version of this notebook in the uh, description below, or if you're reading this on the Pinecone, uh, article page it will be in the resources section at the bottom and yeah we'll, we'll start going through that 
Okay, so we're going to start by downloading and pre-processing our ImageNet data set. So we're not using the actual ImageNet itself, we're using another hosted version of ImageNet, which is much smaller, uh, that we can find on Hugging Face. So to use this, we will need to uh, pip install a few things. So pip install data sets, which is where we're gonna, this is how we're gonna use the um, ImageNet data set. And later on, we're also going to be using Torch and Torch Vision. So, so install those as well. So this is the data set we're gonna use. So we're using this Macy Tiny ImageNet data set. Now, the, this is a validation split and that contains, I think it's 10,000, uh, we can see here. Yeah, 10,000 labeled images. Okay, and then we can see a single record in there. So uh, we have every image is stored as a pill image object and they have these labels. So this one has label zero. We don't necessarily know what that means right now, uh, but later on we'll, we'll see how we can actually figure that out. So the so this one's referring to the actual training uh, data set. So the training split of this data set does contain 100,000 of those labeled um, images. Now we can check the type, it's the, the pill object, and we can see, okay? So when we're in a, a notebook like this, we can just call this ImageNet. And this is just how we, we show that uh, in the notebook. So we can see it's a goldfish. So we can probably guess that label zero actually means goldfish. So there are a few pre-processing steps that we need to go through. So we need to convert all images into an RGB format. So it will have three color channels. We need to resize all these images to fit the expected dimensions of AlexNet. We need to convert it into a tensor for PyTorch. We need to normalize those values and stack. So when we have multiple images, we're gonna stack them all into a single tensor. Okay, it's to create our, our batch. So we start with RGB. AlexNet, as I, as I mentioned, assumes all images have three color channels, red, green, and blue. Uh, but there are many other formats that are supported by pill objects. So we'll see here that we have grayscale, okay? So this is 201, this is a grayscale image because we have this L. Uh, there are other formats as well, so we need to be aware of those. Um, and we can see it's, I think it's an alligator. I, yeah, an alligator in grayscale, okay? So we convert it into red, green, and blue, and we'll see, okay, it's still grayscale, <laughs> that's, that's fine, um, it will still be shown as grayscale, but in reality, uh, this only has one color channel, which is actually just like a brightness channel, whereas this now has three color channels, red, green, and blue, but they're all of equal values across, the, across those three channels, so it actually still shows as being grayscale, even though it is in a RGB format. This is how we handle the RGB part, but we also need to resize the image to fit the expect dimensionality uh, for AlexNet. So for AlexNet and for a lot of other uh, computer vision models, the height and width of the, uh, the input images is expected to be at least 224 pixels. So we need to do that. Uh, we can by using this. So we're going to uh, first we resize the images because these are very small images and they're not necessarily all going to be the, the square that we need, the, the 224 by 224. So we resize them to be bigger and then we use this center crop to crop out any edges and, and, and make sure that it is now a, a square image of that dimensionality. And yeah, we're doing that using this transforms function from Torch Vision, which is a very good, way of pre-processing your, your image data it has a lot of functions and we'll see we'll use a couple more of those uh, very soon. So if we have a look at our first image, the goldfish image, we see it's now a bit bigger and we can also see it's kind of cropped some of it as well, but we still get the, you know, we still get the idea of what is in that image. So if we compare that to this here, we can kind of see its eye at the front there and more of its head, uh, whereas here it's kind of almost chopped off. Now, another thing we need to do is um, normalize all the values in these, in these images. So RGB arrays tend to be in the range of zero up to 255. 
uh, we need them to be in the range of zero to one. And we need to normalize them using these values that you see here. So this mean of 0 0.4 and so on, and the standard deviation of 0 0.2 and, and so on. This is specific to the AlexNet implementation from, from PyTorch. So, so we go on the AlexNet PyTorch page, we can go down and it, here we go. So the images have to be loaded into a range of zero to one and normalized using the, the values I just showed you. So that's why we're using those. And yeah, so we create this uh, process function and then we process our image through it and then we can check the size. So the, the final result here is, is going to be a normalized tensor that we want and it's in the, the correct dimension. It has the correct dimensionality that we need as well. So yeah, that, that's perfect. Now we want to put all this together and we don't want to do it for every single image like this. We're, we're just going to put it all together for a, a, a mini batch of, of images. So we're going to go with the first 50 images because, because they're all goldfish and we can easily check the AlexNet's uh, performance on, on that single uh, single object. So I'm going to redefine that pre-processing pipeline using everything we've just done. So we'll resize, we crop it uh, to tensor. We have to do this, by the way, um, because PyTorch is expecting a tensor object and before we normalize it, we, we, it needs to be in that tensor format, otherwise we're going to get an error. Uh, and then, yeah, we normalize it. So we go through every image in the first 50 images, and we first convert any that are grayscale to RGB, not R RBG, <laughs> RGB, and we pre-process them. Okay, and just append them to a list. Now, that list, we want to stack all those together into a single tensor. So we do that here and we get this final mini batch of our images. So we have a, a mini batch of 50 and we have those, those images that you can see with the dimensionality here. So with all of that done, we're now ready to move on to the inference step. So the, the prediction of the class label is for our images with AlexNet. So the first thing we're going to want to do is download the model, which is going to be hosted by PyTorch. So uh, we can do that here. So let me, so you can see a bit better. Uh, we import Torch, the so PyTorch, and we just do Torch Hub Load. Okay, PyTorch Vision. This is just the, the version that we're using. Uh, and then we have AlexNet, and we're not going to train AlexNet. It would, it would take a, a bit of time. So we're going to use the pre-trained model weights. So this version of AlexNet has already been trained. Uh, and then we just say it to evaluation mode uh, for for our inference. So for the predictions, we don't want to train it uh, by default. I think it is in train mode, which looks like this. We want it in evaluation mode. And then we can see the model structure here as well. So you can see AlexNet, we have so this is where we're creating the, the image features. So there's many of these convolutional layers followed by the radio activation function, followed by the max pooling layer. And with each of those, the model creates a more abstract tensor that represents the, the sort of information from that image. So you can sort of imagine here that the, the the abstraction, so the feature that's been extracted is like, okay, there's some straight edges here and some some curved edges here. We go a little further and this is like, okay, this is a this is an animal or this is a fish. And then by the time we get to here, it's like, okay, this is a goldfish, hopefully. And then uh, we move on to the classifier part. So the classifier is these three layers. So we have dropout, this, this dropout was added to um, reduce the chance of overfitting and improve uh, the ability of the model to generalize. And yeah, we have these linear, linear, linear. Okay, so these are the linear layers, the fully connected linear layers that produce the final 1000 activations. And the highest of these activations represents the class that the model is predicting as being the, the class that identifies the image that it saw. So that's the model, we initialize it, 
Uh, if we can, it's better that we move the model over to either a CUDA GPU, if available, or uh, more recently, we have the Apple Silicon chips. So if you are on a Mac with Apple Silicon, you'll want to use MPS. Okay, so that's the case for me. I have a, I'm going to run all of this on MPS. So we move the inputs to the device and we move the model to the, to the device. Now, when we move the model to the device, it does this in place. So we don't need to, like we did here, where it's inputs equals, um, we just write this. And then we run the model. So we set torch, you know, grad to say we don't need to calculate the gradients because we do that for training the model. We're just performing inference. So we get our outputs, uh, we detach them from the model, and then we can sort of see the shape. So we have these 50 vectors of 1000 items. So that's 50 activations across all of our 1000 uh, classes. And we can, we can see those here, okay? Now these are not normalized. So if, we, if you want to calculate the probability from this, uh, we use the a softmax function. So we would do that like this, okay? That, that would map everything to a probability distribution. And you'd be able to get the probability of like say the top five uh, classes, for example. Uh, but we don't, we don't necessarily need to do that uh, for what we're doing here. So we could actually skip this. Um, so up here we are getting the output. So we could skip this the probability part and just replace that with output and it will, we will get the same result for what we're doing here, which is taking the value or the index position of the maximum value out of those 1000 classes. So here we're getting a uh, one. Okay. Now, if you remember earlier on the labels that we had in this data set were zero for the, for the goldfish. And the reason these are different is because the data set actually uses a different set of labels. So it's, it's not actually the same, but if we, if we do this, so, um, over here, let me open this and show you. So over here, we have a, a text file where each class is separated by a new line character. So this is number zero, a tench. And number one is a goldfish, right? So if we, we get that information, so number one, we can see there's a lot of goldfish predictions here, which is a, a good sign. Um, we can import those, those classes and we can um, create this pred prediction labels by just splitting the response we get from this um, by new line characters. And then what we do is if you print out prediction labels one, we get goldfish. Okay, so the, the, you know, the text label for that prediction. And yeah, so we have the first 50 images, all of those are goldfish and we can, we can see here. So I'm just printing out the last three. You see they're all goldfish. So we would expect everything, all of these predictions to be goldfish if the model is performing well. Okay. And yeah, we see for the, for the most part, it, it, that is the case. Now, if we calculate the performance or the accuracy here, we get 72%. So that represents a top one error rate of 28%, which beats the reported uh, error rate of the AlexNet model in 2012 on the ImageNet challenge, uh, which was 37.5 for the, for the top, top one. However, uh, this is, I, I will point out that this is just a single class. And this is a single uh, label. Uh, goldfish, right? And the model will perform better on goldfish than other things. Okay. So when we test this across the, if we test this across the whole data set, one, we have to map all of the different labels between the, uh, between the AlexNet model and the data set that we have here, because the labels have kind of messed up. Uh, so it takes a bit of extra work, but if we do that, the performance will not be as good. Nonetheless, I think that is a pretty good result. So that's it for this video. That's our overview of one of the most significant events in computer vision and, and deep learning. The ImageNet challenge was hosted annually until 2017. By then, 29 of 38 contestants had an error rate of less than 5%. So, you know, over those years, 
the models, the progress in computer vision just kind of went crazy. AlexNet ended up being superseded by even more powerful convolutional neural networks. Microsoft Research Asia uh, was the, the first other team to beat AlexNet and they did that in 2015. And since then, there have been many other sort of state-of-the-art convolutional networks that have, have, have come and gone. And even more recently, there are the possibility of other networks coming in, uh, such as transformer models, and disrupting the dominance of, of convolutional neural networks in computer vision. Now, I'll leave you with the final paragraph of the, of the AlexNet paper, because it almost seems like they saw the future uh, of deep learning. They noted that they did not use any unsupervised pre-training, even though they expect it will help. And our results have improved as we make our network larger. But we still have many orders of magnitude to go in order to map the infrotemporal pathway of the human visual system, so to match human level performance. Now we know that unsupervised pre-training and ever greater models, ever deeper models, were really sort of the key to all of the improvement gains that we've got in deep learning in the past decade. So I hope that has been useful. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you again in the next one.